respect that Virginians feel for him. So, now he is back in Richmond again, elected governor in 1799. At the State House, he leads the legislature in enlarging school systems and cleaning up Virginia's rivers. And he serves as governor a second time in 1811. But President James Madison cut short Monroe's first term as governor to bring him to Washington as Secretary of State. Here is where he lives and works as Great Britain and the United States move inevitably toward war. Monroe takes a tough stand with England on the constant harassment of American shipping and the impressment or kidnapping of our seamen. Eventually, conflict cannot be avoided. And Madison and Monroe sign the Declaration of the War of 1812. But the United States is in trouble, for its army and navy are terribly small and ineptly led. Strong British forces move toward Washington. But Monroe moves as well, riding hard. Old soldier at heart, the 56-year-old Secretary of State with 25 dragoons, for days boldly scouts the enemy advance, trying in vain to save the capital. At the White House, Dolly Madison desperately packs state papers and valuable portraits. Public buildings, including the White House and the Capitol, go up in flames as the British reach the city, sacking and burning, then leave. At the Octagon House, which becomes the temporary White House, Monroe is the only key member of the administration with military experience. So President Madison appoints him Secretary of War, in addition to being Secretary of State. At the Octagon, Monroe meets the crisis firmly, working long days on war problems, advising Madison. Nights, Monroe works at his own home, hardly sleeping at all, analyzing military forces and funds. And his efforts pay off. On Lake Erie, Commandant Perry defeats the British fleet. We have met the enemy, and they are ours. Old Ironsides shoots the English warship Guerriere to pieces and captures it. On land, Monroe encourages our forces to hold firm, not winning, but no longer in retreat. At Fort McHenry, Monroe orders decisive action to save the rich prize of Baltimore from being captured by the enemy. The bursting bombs and blazing rockets of the British attack on the fort are watched from a ship by Francis Scott Key. But at dawn, the star-spangled banner still flies defiantly. Key writes the dramatic poem, which eventually becomes our national anthem. In this circular room in the Octagon House, Monroe and Madison reject the arrogant peace terms offered by Great Britain. Monroe sends General Andrew Jackson to save New Orleans from British attack. With the help of pirate Jean Lafitte, intrepid old Hickory decisively whips the larger enemy forces, and the War of 1812 is over. In Belgium, the British and Americans work out the Treaty of Ghent to formalize the troubled peace. Back at the Octagon, Monroe and Madison review the treaty, and the president eventually signs it. The War of 1812 is really a draw, but Monroe has become a hero, and his march to the presidency is assured. 1817, he is inaugurated at an outdoor ceremony at the Capitol, with the oath administered by his boyhood friend, Chief Justice John Marshall. President Monroe and his handsome First Lady move into the rebuilt, repainted White House for which many of the furnishings are Monroe's own. As we walk these streets of Washington during Monroe's first term, excitement can be felt, for weakened Spain cannot control the marauding Seminole Indians and freebooters in Spanish Florida who raid and burn American towns across the Georgia border. Monroe sends troops and eventually forces Spain to sell Florida to us for five million dollars. In the House of Representatives, tempers run high when the territory of Missouri asks to be admitted to the Union as a slave state, upsetting the delicate balance of 11 free states and 11 slave states. Monroe eventually signs the Missouri Compromise, allowing Missouri to enter as a slave state 
Maine to come in as a free state, and most of the rest of the Louisiana Purchase Territory to be banned from slavery forever. 1822. Led by Simon Bolivar and other revolutionary liberators, almost all of South and Central America has freed itself from the tyrannical rule of Spanish and European viceroys. President Monroe and the Congress offer formal recognition to the new republics. But the barometer of Monroe's administration shows stormy weather ahead. For in the West, Imperial Russia moves down the Pacific coast almost a thousand miles along the Oregon Territory, establishing a fur trading post only 80 miles north of present-day San Francisco. On weekends at his newly completed Virginia plantation, Monroe ponders these complex problems. Deeply troubled, he paces the stately rooms of Oak Hill, pondering, sometimes at his desk, sometimes walking in the lovely gardens at dawn. He is worried that France and the Holy Alliance of Russia, Austria, and Prussia will attempt to recapture for Spain the Latin American colonies that had declared their independence. Or worse, will European nations try to petition these ex-colonies among themselves? What if Spain sells nearby Cuba to Great Britain? In Washington, Monroe's cabinet engages in long, heated debates on the questions. With the tremendous help of John Quincy Adams, his Secretary of State, President Monroe finally reaches a history-making decision. At this desk at the White House, he drafts and signs what is later to be known as the Monroe Doctrine as part of his annual message to Congress, a masterful stroke of open diplomacy. He declares to the world that the American continents are no longer open to European colonization that extension of European political systems to the Western Hemisphere would be dangerous to the United States, that any move by Europe to control the South American republics would be considered unfriendly to the United States. Hard thoughts made into United States policy, a message that clearly implies hemispheric unity, a recognition by Monroe 150 years ago that the defensive frontiers of America are well beyond national boundaries. And exactly 25 years later, a writer by the name of Karl Marx and a cloth manufacturer named Friedrich Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto, which laid the foundations for another international system eventually to find itself on a collision course with the Monroe Doctrine. 1825. James Monroe is riding back to beautiful Oak Hill Plantation where he plans to spend his last years. Weary, beset by the ill health of his wife and himself, the 67-year-old statesman brings with him only the memories and heavy debts of half a century of public service and a Revolutionary War bullet still in his shoulder. He pens his autobiography and despite illness, serves as a regent of the newly opened University of Virginia. Congress, long ignoring Monroe's repeated claims for reimbursement for expenses for his years in England, France, and Spain, at last grants only $30,000, too little and too late, for a man living in the shadow of bankruptcy. His devoted wife Elizabeth dies in 1830, leaving Monroe grief-stricken in the lovely, lonely rooms of Oak Hill. In 1830, he goes to New York City, a recluse in the home of his youngest daughter, Maria, the wife of the New York postmaster. And here he dies on July 4th, 1831, age 73, the third ex-president to cross into history on the very anniversary of American independence. The last of the cocked hats, he rests today in Richmond, back in his beloved Virginia. When the steady march of European colonialism carved up Asia and Africa during the last half of the 19th century, the Monroe Doctrine was a bulwark between the Western Hemisphere and imperialist conquest. Here are some of the times that the principles of the doctrine came into force since Monroe's time. 
1945, the White House vigorously reiterates the doctrine, enforcing England to set a reasonable boundary line between British and American claims in the disputed Oregon Territory. 1849, President Fillmore prevents France from making the Hawaiian Islands a French protectorate. 1861, a French army presses forward in Mexico to set up a European monarchy under puppet Emperor Maximilian. When 50,000 American troops threaten the French in Mexico, France is forced to withdraw. The 1880s, the U.S. bars Germany from taking over the Danish West Indies and other sites as Caribbean naval bases. 1895, President Cleveland threatens war if Great Britain does not submit the border dispute between British Guiana and Venezuela to arbitration. 1898, the Spanish-American War. Historians ask, was it the Monroe Doctrine or growing U.S. expansionism that led to the United States intervention in Cuba and Puerto Rico? 1902, England, Germany, and Italy blockade Venezuela in order to collect revenues owed them. Teddy Roosevelt sends the U.S. fleet into the Caribbean, and the European powers back off. This and similar events lead to Roosevelt's tough corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, that the United States must be the policeman of the West, supervising the finances and conduct of Latin American countries that misbehave or default on their debts to European powers, all as a means of preventing European intervention and occupation. On this basis, U.S. Marines go into the Dominican Republic in 1905, Nicaragua, in 1911, and Haiti in 1915. Some Latin American countries bitterly denounce the U.S., and the Monroe Doctrine falls into heavy disrepute. It is not until the 1930s that Teddy Roosevelt's big stick policy is replaced, and the U.S. moves to Pan-Americanization, the good neighbor policy, and eventually joint action by the United States and Latin America via the Pan-American Union and the Organization of American States, the OAS. 1940, when German conquest of France and the Netherlands raises the threat of possible Nazi occupation of French and Dutch possessions in the Western Hemisphere, the U.S. leads Latin American countries in stating the firm no-transfer principle. As World War II continues, and Germany overruns Denmark, the U.S. temporarily takes the Danish colony of Greenland under American protection. 1954, the U.S. encourages the OAS to adopt a declaration by the Western Hemisphere against the inroads of international communism. 1962, the communist Cuban dictatorship, with heavy Russian assistance, recklessly builds an intermediate-range missile capability almost within the sight of Florida. President Kennedy orders a naval blockade of Cuba to stop war materials from coming in then sternly warns the Kremlin that aggressive action by Cuba against any country of the Western Hemisphere will result in immediate retaliation against the USSR as well. The OAS endorses the blockade, and the Soviet Union, it is believed, quickly removes the missiles on a U.S. pledge of no invasion of Cuba. 1970. The U.S. warns Russia that Soviet nuclear submarine bases in Cuban ports will not be tolerated. So, this is where we stand a century and a half after Monroe stated his message. Some Latin American countries move toward the left with the encouragement and assistance of Russia, Cuba, and Red China. Likely there will be more. And the U.S. must face difficult, vital issues in the years ahead. The doctrine, a declaration of U.S. self-defense, has changed with the times. But even if... As some observers believe, the doctrine has been abandoned. Its message of freedom lives on. For the principles of the Monroe Doctrine will not be forgotten, so long as Americans remember their sacred ideals of liberty. James Monroe said it for us all. Liberty is a flame that might be dimmed from time to time, but which will ultimately burst forth again more gloriously. Thank you.